So welcome. I'm glad you're here. And to all of you uh, in your living rooms right now, welcome. You're a part of this. And I'm hoping that we will all join into this with the spirit of Christ today. Here, here's why. Uh, we've been in this series called Fake News, and I was all ready. I was ready this week with my funny stories of fake news that I was going to open with. And I just couldn't do it today. It was just one of those days <clears throat> that, uh, that's just challenging for me. We've been in this series called Fake News, right? Where it's all about fake news that almost wrecked this church in Galatia. And I, I was going to start with it, but I couldn't because our world is grieving and hurting and angry right now. Our world is grieving because of the death of Breonna Taylor. And I'm just going to step right into it today. I'm not going to avoid it. I just want us to talk open-heartedly and with the love of Christ about this. So here's where we're going to head with this. Just in case some of you have no idea what I'm talking about, I don't know, there may be one or two of you, okay? <laughs> Let me cover this. And by the way, when I bring this up, I know that there's some of you, God bless you, that are going to say, but pastor, did you know? And you're going to bring up your facts that you've checked on and you might think, I don't know this. Can I just tell you, if you ask me the question, pastor, did you know? The answer is yes. I've read everything that I could possibly find on this. So yes, I know. Just in case you don't know, back in March, police had a warrant to enter the home of Brianna Taylor because it was thought that she may be connected to a known drug dealer. She was connected to him, but had broken ties with him. So at 12.40 a.m., police knocked on her door, and it's unclear, it's disputed uh, how loudly or how much they announced that they were the police, and they broke down her door. Her boyfriend, who was in her apartment, Kenneth Walker, legally owned a gun and thought that intruders were breaking in. He and Brianna walked to the hallway, and Kenneth, seeing someone breaking into the place, fired a shot to defend them, not realizing it is a police officer, and a police officer was hit. Officers returned fire, killing Brianna Taylor. And some of you might be wondering, if, uh, if you haven't been keeping up with this, why now? Why is the world so upset now? Well, because last week, Kentucky Attorney General announced that no criminal charges were going to be filed against police officers directly involved with her killing. Uh, there is one officer who is facing charges because he fired through a doorway covered by a curtain without being able to see who he's firing upon. So let me make several observations about this. Just because it was determined that officers didn't do anything illegal doesn't mean that everything was done in good judgment. And it doesn't mean that changes shouldn't be made. Observation number two, the system failed Brianna Taylor, and she's not coming back because of it. The observation number three, People are hurting over this. They're hurting over this, and let me explain this. People of color, they're hurting over this because when they see this happen, they're not seeing it. Well, they're, they're, they're imagining, that's my daughter. What's keeping, someone from, what's keeping the police from coming through my daughter's front door? They're seeing their mom in this situation. And if I'm being very vulnerable and very frank with you, if that search warrant was served at my house, and I thought it was intruders coming in the front door, I'm not sure I would do anything different than Kenneth Walker did. And the results might be the same. Fourth observation. When dealing with how to respond, we have to get this right. Regardless of what station you listen to, we need to grieve this. We grieve for the family who lost a daughter. We grieve that a system failed her. We even grieve for all of those people, and I mean all of those people involved, including police officers who are grieving over this. Second, we know that the right response isn't violence. 
It's not violence against the community. It's not violence against the city. It's not violence against one another. And it is not violence against the police. Third, in how to respond, here's what I believe. God has an answer for this. Not only does God have an answer for this, I believe that the church has an answer for this. And it is found right here in the book of Galatians in the middle of our study of what's already been planned for today, maybe by divine appointment. And you might be thinking, ah, pastor, you are way over promising what the scriptures provide for us in moments like this. I assure you, I am not over promising you. If the world could pause for a moment and give credit to Jesus for some words that he spoke for truths that he gave us, for good news that he brought us, so much would be healed. So much would be changed. And so here's what we're going to do. I want you to open your Bibles. Galatians chapter 2. Let's take a look at it. I know you're in your car. Open your Bible. I know you are sitting on your couch in your pajamas. Open your Bible, all right? Here's what we're going to do today. I'm going to tell you the story of three tables. The story of three tables. Uh, table number one is about a new standard of love. So if you would um, imagine this, give me your eyes for just a moment, that the table is here. And this is the first table. And right in the, the middle of this table right here is Jesus. And he is seated on the floor. And usually those tables are very short. And he is seated. And next to him is John, because John was one of his favorites, right? And then within reaching distance, Peter's somewhere over here. And then all of his disciples, they, they're surrounding this table. It's a special night. It's a celebration. And at this table, they're celebrating that thousands of years ago, God rescued people out of Egypt. And they go through this whole ceremonial dinner celebrating how God rescued them. And at one point, Jesus gets up and he grabs a towel and he grabs a bowl of water. And he goes, John, come here. Give me your feet. John's like, no, no. Stop messing, Jesus. Shut up, John. Give me your feet. It's a loose translation of the scriptures, okay? And he gets his feet. And just imagine for a moment that you're John. And he starts washing his feet with the water. I mean, can you feel the cool water on your own feet? Can you imagine Jesus' hand moving in between your toes? Yes, I know. You flinch. Because it tickles, right? And at the same moment, you flinch too because, because this is awkward. I mean, Jesus, uh, hey, we are your followers and we love you, but this is a little personal. One of his disciples flinched. It wasn't John, it was Peter. Peter flinched and he's like, why, why are you washing my feet? You shouldn't be doing this. I mean, you're the teacher, you're the rabbi. See, the person to wash the feet in the room, <laughs> it was supposed to be the lowest servant, not the highest guest of honor. And Jesus washes each one of their feet as he goes around the room. And then he makes this statement. He says, now that I have washed your feet, I want you to do for each other what I've done for you. I want you to wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And by the way, this right here, this is why most people, they don't want to deal with Jesus today. Because 2,000 years ago, he got down and he got very personal and he washed people's feet. And people don't want to have a lot to do with Jesus because the reality and the truth is this, that he gets personal with us. Not to clean our feet, but to clean our souls. And it's awkwardly personal because when people are confronted by Jesus, he's like, I want to help you. I want to clean you up, but I'm not going to ignore the dirt that's here. And so people avoid Jesus because it's awkward to meet him and be with him and follow him means admitting that there's something dirty about our souls. But Jesus says this, now that I've done this for you, here's how I want you to love each other. With that same kind of ridiculous, generous love, be a servant, love each other generously, be personal with each other. And just in case they missed it, right at the end of the, the dinner, he says this, I have a new commandment for you. 
they've heard this all before, but it's a brand new standard of love. He says this in John 13, 35, he says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And if you do it right, here's what he says, by this everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Now don't miss this, context matters. You know whose feet he washed there? Way on the end, there's a guy by the name of Judas. He hadn't left the dinner yet. It's important to note this. Because Jesus, the same way he loved John, one of his favorites, he also lovingly washed the feet of Judas, the one whom he knew would betray him. And he would call him out just a moment later. If Jesus says, I want you to love one another in the same way, it means that we get to love even the Judases of the world. Even right after that, he turns around, he says, not only is one of you going to betray me, but one of you is going to deny me. There's a betrayer here and there's a denier here. And all the disciples start looking around like, oh, who's that going to be? And Peter's like, not me. I'm bold. I'm brave. I'm Peter. <laughs> and Jesus looks at him. He just says, before that sun comes up tomorrow morning, you're going to deny me three times. Jesus washed Peter's feet. He washed the feet of the betrayer, and he washed the feet of the denier. See, there is a brand new standard to the love that Jesus was showing. But listen, this is not the first time that Jesus set this standard of love. Someone came to him and said, Jesus, what's the most important command? He said this, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And without being asked, hey, is there a second command? Jesus goes right into it. He says, here's the second command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you can get these two things down, you don't need a list of rules to follow. If you can love God and love people with a generous, ridiculous kind of love, you're going to get everything right. You're going to do it the way that I would do it. On another occasion, Jesus gave us what's known as the golden rule. You've heard this, right? The golden rule is this. Do to others as you would want done them. Let me try that again. Do to others as you want done to you. However you want people to treat you, treat them that way. It's actually a really simple rule. Just treat people how you want to be treated. Well, here it is. I don't want to be judged. I, I don't even want people to treat me how I deserve, right? Because I have bad days, don't you? <laughs> and there's sometimes I deserve a whole lot less love. I want people to be so ridiculously generous with their love towards me. And Jesus says, if you can get that, then just love people that way. See, it's simple and it's clear, but it's super, super difficult to do. But let's make clear this. That's table number one. I want to take you to table number two because at table number two, it represents how you and I, we mess up the golden rule all the time. Paul is actually, uh, it, that takes us to Galatians 2, okay? So in Galatians chapter 2, Verse 11, Paul is writing this story about this table. And let me describe to you who's present here. Peter's here. And he's probably right in the, the center of the table where Jesus probably would have sat because he's the main dude right now. And surrounding him are all of these Christians. But see, there's a difference in the Christians that are there. Some of them are, are Jewish Christians. And, and some of them are Gentile Christians. Now, to say that they were from different ethnicities, I'm not talking about like, hey, they, they did a, a test with like ancestry or 23 and me or whatever those tests are. And like, it came back and like, oh, I'm from this part of Scandinavia. Oh, I didn't know that. We are different. They didn't need a test to know that the people around the table grew up different with different values. They didn't need a test because they grew up on different parts of the city, different parts across town, and they would have never crossed paths because one of those groups would look at the other and just go, you people are worse than a street dog. There was racism around this table, but yet now they were all Christians. And this story goes like this, Galatians chapter 2 verse 11. 
When Peter came to Antioch, it might say in your Bible, Cephas, another word for, for Peter. When Peter came to Antioch, Paul, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. Let's make sure we, uh, we get this right. So Peter is here, and actually the group, they don't seem very divided. The Jews and Gentiles, because they're all followers of Christ, they're getting along. They're cheering each other. I mean, it's a, it, they're having this intimate, great dinner. And yet some people show up that are connected to Peter's background, people who respected Peter, and Peter wanted their admiration. And they show up, and they look at this and go, what, what, what? There's people there that are different than us. Why are these Gentiles around the table? And Peter slowly is backed away. I don't know if Peter intended to hurt all those Gentile believers by making them feel like second-class citizens around this Christian table. I don't know if he meant to mislead all the other Jewish Christians sitting around the table, but it created the divide that said in the Christian faith, there are some who are less and some who are more. And Paul said, hell no. Not in the church. Shouldn't take place in this world. And so Paul calls him out. And he says, you've got this wrong, Peter. And so let me walk us through this, uh, how we mess up the golden rule. We substitute sometimes for the golden rule what's called the silver rule. <laughs> you ready for this? The silver rule is this, don't do, others, don't do to others what you don't want done to you. Let me simplify it. Don't harm anybody. You don't want anyone to hurt you, so don't hurt anyone else. The problem with this is that it falls way short of Jesus' standard. So let me put this in context of our racial conflicts today. If you're white, in the midst of racial discussions, have you ever felt like people of color have called you a racist or tried to make you feel like a racist and your statement is, I'm not racist. Don't honk right now. <laughs> and you might be right when you say, I'm not a racist. But when you say, I'm not a racist, it's the same thing as saying, I'm not harming anyone. We're claiming the silver rule. I'm not doing to people what I don't want done to me. You get that? Jesus' golden rule is a higher, more difficult standard. It says, do to others as you want done to you. If I felt betrayed by people, and if I felt betrayed by policies because of the color of my skin, I would want people to stand with me and grieve with me. It is not enough for us to state, but I'm not a racist. Christians must be anti-racist. Now hear this. This is super important. This doesn't mean that you have to agree with every person who wants you to agree with what racism looks like and how do you fix the problem. I'm never going to stand in agreement with people who act violently against the police. I will never. I will never stand in agreement with people who act violently against the community. But I also won't stand in agreement with people who look down on other people or who stay inactive and passive as if to say, I'm not hurting anybody. Because that's not Jesus' golden rule. He says actively. Engage and love people with a ridiculous kind of love. The second way that we get the golden rule wrong is this, exclusive neighbors. <laughs> we just want to pick and choose who deserves our love by picking who our neighbors are. I, I will love people ridiculously. Just let me pick who it is I get to love. Remember, context matters, right? And where the golden rule shows up in Luke 6, can I read to you what the context of the story is? This is what Jesus says right before he, he gives the golden rule. He says, love your enemies. Ugh. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. That sucks. 
we, we don't like it. Sorry if that's offensive to you. I just got to be real honest. We don't like it. We want a loophole. For those who offend us, mistreat us, we want justice and we want to show them that they're wrong. And Jesus just says this, however you want to be treated, particularly when you get it wrong, you don't want justice. You want a ridiculous kind of love and so you don't get to pick your neighbor. The third thing, way that we get this wrong, if you go back to the, the story in Galatians, we see this ripple effect of Peter's prejudice response. It ends up doing this, misleading the masses. It says the other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. You know what that guy's name means? Son of encouragement. He's the guy that when he shows up, the party starts because everybody loves Barnabas. He's the life of the party. He is this essence of, how are you? I want to hear what's going on in your life. I mean, he's the essence of encouragement. And Barnabas at this dinner goes, well, if Peter walks away, if these others are walking away, I could just see him as the last one there. Looking around going, Maybe I'm wrong. I thought what Jesus meant was love one another. And it was a way bigger net than what these guys think it is. And if Peter's walking away, maybe I should too. This is why the church is so critical. If we get this wrong, we could mislead the masses. We can't get this wrong. Which brings me to this, and this might be the most important part of all of this talk, because it's the very root of Peter's mistake. O open your Bibles, look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 14, and this is where I'm going to uh, stop the story here, but you need to see this, and I, I hope you'll underline this. Paul says, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you're a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow these Jewish customs? Don't miss the first part of the statement. Here's what he says. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. Here's Peter's problem. Ready? It's all summarized right here. Peter didn't understand the gospel. What is that? He didn't understand the good news. He didn't clearly understand the good news that Jesus brought. Now, wait, 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 wait. I thought the good news, I thought the gospel was this whole message about how Jesus came to die on a cross to save me from my sins. It's about forgiveness. It's about a relationship with God, right? Well, yes, we believe Jesus died on a cross in our place for our sins, and our faith in him allows us to receive this relationship with God. But here's where we get the gospel wrong, and here's where Peter got this wrong. If you remember me saying this, that at the foot of the cross, the ground is all level. It's not a statement about the geography of where the cross was. It's a statement about there's no one better or worse at the cross. You can't look at yourself and go, oh, I'm so much better than all these other people. And you can't look at them and go, oh, they're so much better than me. The ground is level at the cross, which means this. It's not just at the cross where you're restored to God. It's at the cross where you're restored to one another. That's all a part of the gospel. We make the mistake that we think the gospel is all about us as individuals. Let me say this. The gospel's not about you alone, but about all of us because it has social implications as well as spiritual implications. The spiritual implications are that you can have a relationship with God. But the social implications are that we would be united and one, not, not one better or worse than the other, but a unified church. Which brings us to table number three. And we'll finish with table number three. It's a table set by Jesus for you and, and I just left it blank there. Set for you and people who don't look like you. People of different races than you. People of different ethnicities than you. We say things like the gospel means that God loves you. And yes, that's true, but it misses the point. Because in John 3.16, for God so loved, not you, 
For God so loved the world. The gospel is about how much he loves us. Now, if you think I'm making some small point about this one verse in the book of Galatians, trust me in this. Underline these. You can read them later for yourselves. In Galatians 3.28, Paul comes up with this statement. He says, there's neither Jew nor Gentile nor slave nor free, nor is there male and female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. He looks at the table of those in Galatians. He just goes, listen, you're all one. When you're in Christ, the ground is level at the cross. You think, okay, there's, there's just one more verse in there. Well, let me give you another one. Galatians 5.14. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> the entire law. Everything, every rule list that you ever have. You don't need a list of rules if all you need to do is just love your neighbor as yourself. Here's the fake news. You ready? The fake news for the week is this. The gospel is just about you and your relationship with God. That's wrong. It's just fake news. It's just not true. It's not good enough because it's not the good news that Jesus died for. He didn't want to just bring us to God. He wanted to bring us back to each other. The church is the bride of Christ. And we're to represent him. Now, I, I really want you to hear this. Because... Particularly you white people. Can I, let me just talk to you for a minute. I'm going to talk to all of us. But it can feel like that the pastor's just wagging his finger at me again. And I'm lecturing you about how you need to get it right because you don't get it right. And that couldn't be farther from the truth right now. So please hear me in this. Please hear me clearly that I am incredibly proud of you as a church. For those of you who've been a part of Church on the Hill... For any length of time, and you're sitting in your car right now, hear me. I love you, and I'm proud of you for how you've dealt with this. For those of you sitting at home and you've been a part of our church, I am proud of you. Here's why. We're not new to this whole discussion. We're not new to embracing people who are different than us. And then now listen, we are not a perfect church because perfect churches do not exist. We aren't above making mistakes, and we're not above making changes. But you have been getting this right for a long time. Here's how I know. When we used to gather in that building behind us, what used to gather in there are black people and brown people and Asian people and Indian people and white people all worshiping together. I'm super proud of you for that. And the word of God in these meetings are delivered by this imperfect white guy, but also by black pastors and Asian pastors and brown pastors, both men and women, who I have invited and you have received. We've been getting this thing right for a while. So please don't think I'm lecturing you to say, oh, you're, you're bad at this. You got to get this right. So can I just say thank you? Thank you that here, even though we're not perfect and we get it wrong sometimes and we're not above making changes, that we're getting it right because if you could see the kind of faces that are looking back at me right now, they're not all white faces, even though this is a white pastor. And I'm proud of you for that. What our world needs is to not back away from Jesus right now because we're afraid to get personal with him. The entire world needs to let Jesus come in and clean out the hurt and the hatred in our souls so that we can forgive and love generously no, no, no. How about love ridiculously? Because in the midst of that, I think an awful lot can be healed and racial divides can be mended. This third table, I'll just end with this. It begs three questions. The third table is the table that Jesus sets for you. Have you taken your seat at the table? Have you said, I believe in the gospel, the good news that Jesus came, who died for me so that I could be restored to relationship with God, so I could be forgiven? That's part of the gospel. But have you taken your seat at the table that says, I'm not only reunited to God, but I'm reunited to a group of people who I now have more in common with than, than divides us? Because the world will divide you by race and ethnicity, but the gospel does not. It unites us. Have you taken your seat at the table? Listen, if you haven't in your living room right now, Receive Christ. 
receive his gift of reconciliation with him and each other. He'll fix the hurts. He'll change you. He will heal the things that divided before. That's our first question. The second question is this. Have you invited other people to join you at the table? I mean, if you have your seat there, are you inviting others to say there's a chair with your name on it? Would you come? Third question. When they come, do you love them all? You can't love everybody in the world. You can't even love all the people in this church that we call Church on the Hill. You can't even love all of them. You just won't be able to know all of them. There's too many. But do you love people who are different than you? Quack, quack, last quick story about the most hated people in Germany. When the German wall came down, Eric and Margaret, Margaret Honecker, they were the most hated people in Germany. He was a part of the, the wall. He was part of the enforcement that if people tried to cross, he gave the orders. If they tried to cross, shoot them. When the wall came down, his party abandoned him, and everybody else in Germany hated him. He was old, and he was sick, and he was put in prison for like a day, but he was so sick, they're like, why do we want to deal with this guy who's sick and old? Like, free him. But Eric and Margaret had no place to go because no one wanted them. They were the most hated people in Germany. Where do they go? Pastor Uwe Holmer opened up his home to them. Um, Pastor Holmer, he had 10 kids. And they all they wanted to go to college, but as they kept applying for college, because they were outspoken against the system in East Germany, the head of education kept denying his kids a college education. No, 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 you can't go because of who you are. You know who the head of the education system was in East Germany? Mrs. Honecker, Margaret. This woman who forbade his family and his kids from seeking a better future. Who was against them, who held them down, who oppressed them. And so when Eric and Margaret had no place to go and they were homeless, this pastor opens up his door, his home, to say, you can come live with me. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know what he received for it? Criticism. Protests outside his home. And the pastor simply said this. This is the right thing to do for an old, sick man. When we pray to forgive our sins and forgive those who sins against us, we must take those words seriously. What does our world need? To stop, pause, and take notice of Jesus. Because he delivers us the gospel that not only reunites us with God, but brings healing. And when the world wants to divide us, Jesus wants to unite us. The answer to our racial conflict in the world is the gospel of Jesus Christ and the good news that he brings. And he gives it to you to deliver to them. I'm so proud of you. But we have so much work to do in this world. I want to pause for just a moment and just ask for God to help us that he might bring healing. So pause with me and let's pray. Heavenly Father, you keep setting the table. You've done it all through history. You keep inviting all kinds of people from different races because your dream is a multi-ethnic church that will be reconciled to you and reconciled to one another and love each other ridiculously. I believe that the hope of this world is you, Jesus, and the good news that you brought. And so God, give us wisdom on how to live this out. Instead of picking sides, Jesus, we pick your side and the side of the gospel but help us not to just stay complacent. Help us to reach people who are angry, hurting, mad, and disenfranchised with what the world is giving us. Lord, let that be an opportunity for your healing and hope to take place. And we pray this all because Jesus made it possible. You made it possible on the cross. We pray in your name. Amen.